At six, plan ahead for Christmas, says a shipping boss amid delays at the UK's ports. A shortage of HGV drivers means around 50,000 containers are still waiting to be collected at Felixstowe, the UK's biggest commercial port. Retailers are warning it will have a knock-on effect on their shelves. We'll still have toys to sell, but if you're looking for choice, don't expect to come in in December and see what you would normally um, experience in a toy store. But the government says they are confident people will be able to get their toys for Christmas. Also tonight, the EU sets out its plans to try to resolve disagreements over post-Brexit trading arrangements in Northern Ireland. Will it be enough? The EU and the UK positions seem far apart as negotiations begin again tonight, but both warn stability in Northern Ireland is at risk. Protesters are dragged away by angry motorists in Essex this morning as they continue to block roads. And Star Trek's William Shatner, at the age of 90, makes history as the oldest person to go into space for a 10-minute journey in Jeff Bezos' capsule. What you have given me is the most profound experience I can imagine. It's, uh, I'm so filled with emotion about what just happened. I, I just, it's extraordinary, extraordinary. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, FIFA condemned the racially aggravated incident in the stands at Wembley last night as calls grow for Hungary to be banned from international football. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at six. Don't panic buy, but do plan ahead for Christmas. That is the message to shoppers from a global shipping boss who has warned that a shortage of HGV drivers is having a knock-on effect on ports around the UK. Felix Stowe is the biggest. It has 50,000 containers waiting to be collected and ships are having to wait for up to 10 days to unload. The port has blamed several factors for the build-up, including the impact of the pandemic. One retailer has warned the problem could hit supplies of toys this Christmas. Well, our transport correspondent, Caroline Davis, is in Felix Stowe for us now. Caroline. International shipping is a worldwide interconnected web. And what we're seeing here in Felix Stowe and beyond is when that web is disrupted. International trade is beginning to reawaken. And as there is more demand for goods shipped over to the UK, the system that gets them from the quayside to the shops is beginning to struggle. Coming in but going out too slowly, Felixstowe is the busiest container port in the UK, bringing in goods from around the world. But for months, the situation at ports here and internationally has been getting worse as demand for goods grows after the pandemic. The situation is caused by a messy mix of global problems, including COVID disruption. But here in the UK, it's made worse by a shortage of HGV drivers to take the goods away. And so they build up. There are around 100,000 containers here. The port normally has around 60 to 70,000 on average. They aren't the only port in this position. Well, this is a global um, issue, so it's happening in ports around the world uh, and it's obviously happening um, in um, all the container ports around the, uh, the UK uh, because of the volume of, um, of, of, of traffic of containers, um, of particularly imports at the moment, uh, which are coming into the UK um, as, as we come out of lockdown. As well as taking time to get goods to the right place, the cost of shipping goods is also going up. The freight rates have gone up massively. I mean, two years ago, you paid about $3,000 for a 40-foot from Shanghai to Felixstowe. This month, it's between $19,000 and $20,000. So as you can see, they've gone up sixfold. And that has a knock-on effect in our shops, including on toys coming in before Christmas. If I use this as an example, uh, this item would 12 months ago have cost us 70 pence to ship from the Far East to the UK. It is now going to cost seven pounds to ship. Now that puts it in perspective. We're selling this at present at 15 pounds. 
that isn't going to happen when the new freight rates come in. The government has reassured shoppers that they should shop normally this Christmas and has said that while global capacity regularly fluctuates, it's continuing to work with the freight industry to tackle the challenges at ports. The supply chain is stuck in a snarl-up and it could take months to unpick. Caroline Davis, BBC News. Well, let's talk to our economics editor, Faisal Islam, who is in Washington, D.C., where the world's finance ministers are meeting this week. And this issue of supply is not just a U.K. problem, is it? Yes, I mean, in the first instance, you can see it much more visibly, actually, in the U.S., in the dozens of cargo ships which are stuck, unable to unload their containers off California and off Georgia. You can see it in the tens of thousands of cars which are unfinished because car companies cancelled their orders for microchips. At the beginning of the pandemic, they thought because of the lockdown, people wouldn't want to buy cars. What happened was that even more people wanted to buy cars because of some of the savings they had from not going out. That meant that used car prices shut up. So you can see that visibly. Uh, and indeed, right now, President Biden at the White House has got America's big companies together and getting them to promise to work 24-7, the big freight companies, to get rid of these uh, supply chain blockages so that Christmas can be normal in terms of the supplies. So this is a global issue. It is being discussed here amongst finance ministers. Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, raised the idea of a global solution to this issue. Though it should be said that there are some UK-specific factors that in some sectors, such as the post-Brexit immigration visas, have made things worse. Other finance ministers think, well, we have to be more self-reliant, have to have more projection locally. That would increase price pressures permanently. But a big issue here for finance ministers to settle. Uh, it's not going to be settled before Christmas. Islam, thank you. A shortage of care staff in the community is causing major problems for hospitals. The BBC has learnt that NHS bosses in England are seriously worried by the number of elderly and vulnerable patients now stuck in hospital because of a lack of support at home and in care homes. Some chief executives have described the current situation as dire. Care companies say the problems they are facing recruiting and retaining staff are acute. In June last year, 6% of posts in the care sector were unfilled. That figure rose to 8.2% in August this year, meaning there is now a shortfall of more than 112,000 people working in care. There are now more unfilled care jobs than before the pandemic. Our social affairs editor, Alison Holt, has this report. It's another extremely busy day for home care manager Vicky and care supervisor Charlotte. Both are normally based in the office, but staff shortages mean they're out caring for people to cover gaps in the rotor. That meant just five hours sleep for Vicky last night. I'm shattered. <laughs> I am tired. I have to keep going on with it. There's until I can recruit again, until we can get more people through the door to, to support. It's not an option not to. The bandages were too tight, but they're all right now. They're here to help 103-year-old Margaret with her lunch and personal care. She recently returned from hospital. How do you feel about being home now rather than being oh, in hospital? I am glad to be home, oh, definitely, after four weeks away. Mm -hmm. But the shortage of care staff is making it increasingly difficult to get people out of hospital. But you have packed up a lot. Comments from hospital chief executives show the huge pressure this is already causing in England. There are a record number of people waiting for care, says one. We've just tipped over the point where delayed discharges are a bigger problem than COVID, says another. And a chief executive whose hospital has 140 patients waiting to be sent home says patients are dying in hospital when their choice was home, hospice or nursing home due to lack of care staff. We're incredibly concerned about the coming winter. We know that hospitals, mental health trusts, ambulance services, all under huge pressure. And we know that that pressure is linked to social care who desperately need the support in order to expand their capacity. Hiya, Carol. Tracy is a nurse and manager at this Sheffield care home. They too are struggling to find care workers with staff exhaustion, compulsory vaccinations and better pay in other sectors all adding to the problems. So those are all from a recruitment agency? These are all from recruitment, yeah. And it's not just one job, there's two or three jobs hidden behind it. But she is also being bombarded by job offers as other companies try to poach her. You're getting emails, you're getting 
um, text messages from companies that I've never even heard of, offering you to go for interviews, offering you jobs. What do you think of that? I've got a job. I'm looking after people to the best of my ability. Right, we need uh, three carers. And when they bring in agency okay. staff to cover the gaps, they sometimes pay more in a day than the council pays them in a week for a resident's care. I think we shouldn't be in this position, but I think social care, you know, it's an integral part of the healthcare system with the NHS. But again, it doesn't feel as though we've had the support that, that's necessary. And I think, we, you know, it could potentially be a bleak times ahead. The government says it has put extra money into social care and that it's running regular recruitment campaigns. Alison Holt, BBC News. The government's latest coronavirus figures show there were 42,776 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period, the highest number since the middle of July. The average number of cases per day in the past week now stands at 39,073. More than 7,000 people were in hospital with COVID yesterday. Another 136 deaths have been recorded. That's of people who died within 28 days of a positive test, which means on average there were 113 deaths per day in the past week. On vaccinations, 85.6% of the population aged 12 and over had had their first dose of a vaccine and 78.7 have been double jabbed. Now, the EU has tonight set out new proposals to try to cut red tape in the continuing row over trade from Great Britain into Northern Ireland. At the start of the year, a new post-Brexit agreement was introduced. It's called the Northern Ireland Protocol. And it means checks are needed on live animals and certain products like chilled meats which cross the Irish Sea from Great Britain. That's because as part of the post-Brexit agreement, Northern Ireland has remained in the EU's single market for goods so that the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland can be kept open and check-free. But it means a new trade border has been created in the Irish Sea, and that's angered unionists who say it undermines Northern Ireland's place in the UK. Well, our island correspondent Emma Vardy is in Belfast. So what is the EU proposing to do to resolve this? Well, Sophie, this all relates to what happens when lorries roll off the ferries here at Belfast Port and for companies that are filling in paperwork um, all over the UK. Now, the EU is offering to cut down some of that red tape and some of that bureaucracy and reduce the need for so many checks on goods on products that are arriving over the Irish Sea here. The hope is it would be less of a headache for companies that send goods to Northern Ireland. But this isn't just about paperwork, it's also about the politics. And the UK is still asking for more. Could this be the light at the end of the tunnel for businesses? Bringing goods into Northern Ireland from Great Britain has become much more difficult under the Brexit arrangements. If we went back to 2020 for a consignment of goods, that's the paperwork that we had to produce. Right. Under the protocol in 2021, this is the paperwork for four or five pallets. And there could be multiple loads of this on one lorry. The UK government argues the difficulties are so serious that it now wants an entirely new treaty. We're seeing fewer, if anybody, wanting to begin moving goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It's GB companies that are supplying smaller quantities to Northern Ireland are simply saying, why should I bother? Cool. what a year. Let's try to make Christmas a little brighter, shall we? Marks and Spencers has said it won't be sending some Christmas products over the Irish Sea because of the red tape. And there was due to be a ban on the British banger being brought into Northern Ireland, as chilled meats can't be imported under EU rules. But the EU has indicated it will now reduce the paperwork. The proposals are understood to include a unique agreement on food to reduce checks on food and drink products moving over the Irish Sea, an arrangement to allow the sale of chilled meats to continue, and the EU said it will change its laws to solve the problems which are posing a threat to the supply of medicines in Northern Ireland. With this robust package of practical, imaginative solutions, we can continue to implement the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, for the benefit of all communities on the ground. 
but logistics are only part of the problem. This is an ideological battle too. Loyalist communities view any type of border in the Irish Sea as severing Northern Ireland's link with the UK, integral to unionist identity here. If we do not kill this protocol, it will kill the union. For the most staunch unionists, the EU's proposals won't go far enough. They still fall uh, far short of what is needed to make the fundamental change that is required. But we recognise there's a negotiating process that will happen now. I would much rather that there was no Brexit. I would much rather that there was no protocol. But we are now where we are. And it's our view that the protocol guarantees protections for the Good Friday Agreement, the all-island economy, and it ensures that there is no border imposed on the island of Ireland. The UK government's also called for an end to the role of the European Court of Justice in the arrangements. But political leaders in the Republic of Ireland say the demands are an act of bad faith. The UK going back on a deal that it signed up to. This is a country that makes treaties, that strikes agreements and then intends to renege on them. And that message must now resonate around the world. Um, don't make any agreement with the British government. Don't sign any treaty with the United Kingdom uh, until you can be confident that this is a country that can honour its promises. Without a resolution, the UK could trigger a clause to override part of the Brexit deal, sparking a potential trade war with Northern Ireland caught in the middle. Emma Vardy, BBC News. Each one of the friends giving the details of the man. Who is in Berlin and the EU has set out its proposals. What now? Well, what now, Sophie, really depends as how far the UK and the EU uh, are willing to bend. They both say that they're in listening mode. They both say they would like to come up with a mutually acceptable way forward on the Northern Ireland Protocol. But their positions at the beginning right now seem pretty far apart. If you listen to Lord Frost, he says you're going to need a real rewrite of this protocol to make it workable. And he insists on removing the European Court of Justice oversight role. The EU says, yes, it'll refine the protocol but it will not redesign it. You've heard its proposals today. It wants to make the day-to-day -day living in Northern Ireland uh, more workable but it will not get rid of the European Court of Justice's role it says as long as Northern Ireland follows the rules of the European single market for goods. So what does this mean? Does it mean that it's almost inevitable that the government will trigger Article 16? That is the ability to suspend part or parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Lord Frost said he'd rather not do it, but he will if he thinks that peace in Northern Ireland is at stake and the talks collapse. The EU says that stability in Northern Ireland is at risk by trying to rewrite the protocol. It says that it is preparing for every eventuality. Germany and France have asked for retaliatory measures for the European Commission to prepare them in case Article 16 is triggered. That's where talk uh, of a possible trade war are coming from. But Sophie, we are really not there yet. Katia Adler, thank you. Police have made 35 arrests today after members of the environmental group Insulate Britain blocked more roads. Demonstrators were dragged out of the way by angry motorists in Essex but immediately returned to join the protest again. John Donison reports. Tempers at boiling point this morning as protesters block roads around the Dartford crossing. Yes, he needs to get to school today. Oh, so move out of the way and let me get my son to school. Mate, you've got to move out of the way. Some drivers took matters into their own hands. This kind of direct action from Insulate Britain has been going on for more than a month, but today produced the ugliest scene so far. <laughs> the activists, though, who are campaigning for homes to be heated more efficiently, say they've been left with no choice. It's impossible for us to do anything else because the government listens to nothing apart from destruction. And we are deeply sorry for the destruction of these people. It's just tragic, but we're left with no other option. Nearby, the police had to free several protesters who glued themselves to the road. Overall, Essex police say 35 people were arrested on suspicion of conspiracy to cause a public nuisance. The government has won a series of high court injunctions, meaning activists could face jail for blocking areas, including those around the M25 and the Dartford crossing. Insulate Britain's tactics are certainly effective in terms of causing disruption. Come on, come on, 
Whether they're winning over much public support, though, is less clear. That's enough, man. No nap time. John Donison, BBC News. The time is almost 20 past six, our top story this evening. Plan ahead for Christmas, says a shipping boss, as a shortage of HGV drivers means delays at the UK's biggest commercial port. But the government says shop normally. And queen of the channel, the swimmer Chloe McArdle makes her 44th crossing, breaking the world record. Coming up in Sports Day on the BBC News Channel, settling back into life in the Premier League, we hear from the new Watford manager, Claudio Ranieri, and why he's feeling relaxed despite the pressures of trying to keep the club in the Premier League. Galloping around the cosmos is a game for the young, so said Captain Kirk in Star Trek. But today, the man who played him proved his words wrong, as William Shatner, at the age of 90, went into space. It was just a 10-minute flight on board the Blue Origin rocket built by Jeff Bezos' company. But the actor made history as he became the oldest person to go into orbit. Back on Earth, he described it as the most profound experience he could imagine. From Texas, Sophie Long reports. As the sun rose over one of the most desolate parts of the Wild West, William Shatner made his way to the New Shepard suborbital spacecraft. William Shatner? He wasn't leading the crew his alter ego commanded, but with three other passengers who would share what the few who've gone before say is a life-changing experience. Dickhead. Two. You're a dick. One. More than 50 years after he first donned a spacesuit as Captain Kirk, William Shatner is now on his way to the final frontier. And there they are, over 328,000 feet, over 100 kilometers. Minutes later, as the new Shepard crossed the internationally recognized boundary with space, he became the oldest person in the world to float there weightless. And to experience the view of Earth, he said he would be entranced by. What a thing to have. He's the oldest guy that went into space. In the days before, he'd laughed while saying he was terrified. But he said his going to space was a miracle. And it was extraordinary to be part of this new beginning of space travel. And capsule touchdown. Welcome back, the newest astronaut. <laughs> He emerged from the capsule, clearly moved by the experience. He said he hopes he never recovers from. The little things are weightlessness. But to see the blue color go, whip, fire! And now you're staring into blackness. That's the thing. What you have given me is the most profound experience I can imagine. I'm so... Filled with emotion about what just happened, I, I just, it's extraordinary, extraordinary. There may be debate over whether he returned to Earth an astronaut, but he has done. gone where no nonagenarian has gone before. Sophie Long, BBC News, Blue Origin, Launchpad One. An MP who made threatening phone calls to a woman because she was jealous of her relationship with her partner has been found guilty of harassment. Claudia Webb, who's the independent MP for Leicester East, was accused of carrying out unwanted phone calls against Michelle Merritt, a female friend of her partner. She allegedly threatened an acid attack and to distribute naked pictures of her. Ms Webb will appeal the verdict. An inquest has been hearing from friends of the first man murdered by the serial killer Stephen Port, who believed police wrongly assumed he had overdosed because he was a gay sex worker. Port went on to kill a further three young men. The inquests are examining whether any of them could have been saved had police acted differently. Our Home Affairs correspondent Daniel Sanford is in London for us now. Daniel. Yes, Sophie, China Dunning told the inquest jury how her friend and fellow fashion student Anthony Walgate had been going to meet a man for sex and was expecting to earn £800, which had worried friends because it was an unusually large amount. Anthony Walgate had even messaged one of the friends the details of the person he was going to meet, adding jokingly, in case I get killed. Two days later, his body was found outside the block of flats where Stephen Port lived, and Stephen Port admitted lying to police about knowing Anthony Walgate, and he was briefly jailed but never arrested on suspicion of murder. 
China Dunning described how she and her friends had repeatedly told Metropolitan Police detectives that Stephen Port was responsible for Anthony Wallgate's death, urging the police to go through uh, Port's computer. When that was eventually done a year after Anthony Wallgate's body was found, the trainee detective constable who did it missed the fact that Stephen Port had made repeated searches for things like unconscious boys and drug rape. And in the meantime, Stephen Port had killed two more young men with the date rape drug GHB and ultimately killed a fourth young man before finally being arrested on suspicion of murder. Sophie. Daniel, thank you. Two more energy suppliers, Pure Planet and Colorado Energy, have just become the latest casualties of the global spike in gas prices. Both companies have stopped trading, affecting hundreds of thousands of customers. The energy regulator Ofgem will now find a new supplier for customers affected. The development brings the number of customers affected by the current wave of energy company collapses to around 2 million. More than 100 MPs and peers are calling on the government to rethink plans to scrap many BTECs in order to pave the way for new vocational qualifications for 16 to 18 year olds in England called T-levels. The government says it's important to avoid duplication and says T-levels will provide a good route into work and university. Our education editor, Brown Jeffries, has this report. I'm honestly not entirely sure what I'm going to do, you know. <laughs> three college students studying at the same level, but three different qualifications, T-level, A-levels and B-techs. Within a couple of years, many B-techs could disappear. Yasna told me she wanted to keep her options open with B-techs. At the beginning of the year, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, so I picked a um, B-tech applied science, which means I can have a variety of choices at, at university. Working with children. That's what Jess wanted to do aged 16, so she chose the more work-based T-level. I like the fact that it's like something that I definitely want to do and it, and it will definitely take me to where I want to be. After two years, Jess will get one T-level, T for technical, worth the same as one or two B-techs or three A-levels. But T-levels have at least 45 days of work experience. So DNA carries the instructions for making protein. To clear the way, some B-techs could be scrapped. And here's the difference. B-techs are studied by a quarter of a million students. T-levels, just a couple of thousand now. T-levels are absolutely central to the government's ambition for higher skills. Designed with employers, they rely heavily on businesses being willing to provide work experience. But their introduction risks being overshadowed by a massive row about withdrawing the very popular BTECs. At this college, they fear losing BTECs will hit the most disadvantaged students hard. Possibly tens of thousands of young people will not have a clear route. Um, they're going to find it very difficult to come to college to gain extra qualifications that will help them further in uh, the, their life. Um, and I think that it, it's a very sort of risky uh, scenario we're faced with at the minute. The minister insists students will have a choice, including using T-levels to go to university. One thing that you can be sure of is that we will ensure there is a good range of courses, there is high quality, and that young people have those opportunities to go into whatever career they want. While students complete their current courses, the first list of those being scrapped in future is expected within months. Brownwyn Jeffries, BBC News, Birmingham. Swimming the channel once is tough enough, but the Australian endurance swimmer Chloe McArdle has just done it for the 44th time, breaking the world record. Our sports correspondent Joe Wilson reports. Dover, 4am. The English channel's out there somewhere. Just follow Chloe McArdle on her 44th crossing. 21 miles against tide and cold. Her progress was tracked by satellite, but the challenge hasn't changed since the silent 20s when the great Gertrude Eddeley of the USA was the first woman to do it. There's 2,000 pounds in cash prizes. And by the 1950s, there was barely enough global goose fat to match demand for channel swimming. 
When Chloe McArdle reached French soil this time, she'd completed a relentless sequence of channel swims over the past year in search of the record. She first began endurance training to help her through post-traumatic stress disorder. It's mental as much as physical fortitude. But bear in mind she'd done this crossing with a chest infection. I had very favourable conditions, so I'm not, uh, I'm not exhausted and, and worn out, which I often am after swimming the channel, which was nice. I really got to enjoy and soak in every minute because I wasn't getting bashed around by the channel. So I'm, I'm just, I've got energy, I feel great, and um, yeah, it's really, really amazing. 44 channel crossings, that is way ahead, incidentally, of what any man has ever managed. Joe Wilson, BBC News. Quite extraordinary. Time now for a look at the weather. Here's Susan Powell. What an act, what an act to follow, <laughs> Sophie. Um, the weather today across the UK has been a little bit benign. If you've seen the sun, you've done rather well. For many of us, the skies were like this. The sun just trying all the time to break through, but the cloud then coming back together into rather solid layers and giving a little bit of a grey impression. And that is pretty much what things will look like for many of us tomorrow too, because we keep this same area of high pressure that we've had today and it locks the weather in place. But coming into the far north of Scotland, there will be a weather front that does shift things on a little here. Through this evening, though, it's a fine story. There's plenty of cloud out there. The wind's relatively light. Temperatures will hover in the higher range of single figures, perhaps double figures in a few spots. And then for early on Thursday, in comes that weather front to northern Scotland. And that will shake things up here because it will bring some heavy rain, but also some very strong winds, gales for the Northern Isles for a time. And then the wetter weather and the stronger winds will sink their way further south as the day progresses. Probably the rain into the central belt of Scotland for the evening rush hour. Elsewhere, a fine story, but one where we will see a lot of cloud around. Some bright spells, but certainly not water wall sunshine. For that, you are going to have to wait till Friday and you are going to have to put up with some colder air coming in behind this weather front, the front from Scotland working its way south across the UK and through Friday, as the front eventually clears to the south of the UK, we will all move back into clearer skies. There will be a lot of sunshine, but there will also be a northerly breeze, particularly across the eastern side of the UK. So it will look brighter, but through the day, actually, as that front comes down, the temperatures in some areas will go down by the time we get into the afternoon. So perhaps mid-teens at best, the highs on Friday. And then with clear skies overnight Friday, look out for a patchy frost. It is, after all, autumn to start us off on Saturday but actually the weather will start to become milder again as the weekend goes on. Sophie. Susan, thank you. And that's all from us. Goodbye. <laughs>